Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the final night of our gospel meeting, which happens to also coincide on a Wednesday evening when we would normally be having our Bible study. Anyone? Uh, I'm going to start by covering our announcements, and then uh, you know, I'll intro the speaker quickly, and then uh, lead us in a prayer. So, as always, um, please keep those on our prayer list in your in, in your prayers. We have a few extra folks that have been added over the last uh, several days, a couple weeks. Tish Clark, wife of B.J. Clark, will meet on the 3rd of October with her oncologist to discuss the results of her treatment. As most know, uh, she's uh, dealing with, uh, I believe, it's brain tumors that uh, she's trying to uh, heal from. We also, uh, for those who might not have been here last night, we rejoice that we have a new sister in Christ, Darlene Lamantia. I was baptized yesterday afternoon, so we're very, very grateful for, for her being enhanced Bible studies at uh, Northern Oak. Tom- uh, will be tomorrow, 6.45, dinner is provided, and we've covered their topics a few times, so hopefully you remember those. Ask everybody to mark their calendars for two Saturdays from now, uh, October 8th. At 8 a.m. at uh, Garcia's, a quarterly men's uh, breakfast opportunity for all the men who are who want to come and share a meal. Uh, join us there. Group one will be hosting the visitors luncheon this Sunday, uh, the 2nd of October. So if you're in group one and you're able to stay, please sign up and put put what you're going to be bringing on the uh, list in the foyer. Group 2 is going to be hosting the Sunday after that, the 9th of October, and same thing there. If you're able to stay, please uh, sign up and tell us what items you're going to be able to bring. Stan and Carol Crowley are leaving tomorrow uh, for a gospel meeting that they're going to be participating in in South Carolina. And uh, at the end of the meeting tonight, uh, Brother uh, Stockton will We'll basically have some closing remarks about the gospel meeting, and uh, and he'll close us in a prayer. So as we've as we've seen uh, so far this week, uh, five times about to be a sixth time. Uh, Brother John Grubb is a powerful gospel preacher. We are very grateful for the messages that he's brought to us, the theme that he brought to us about the the unity of the church. Last night's lesson was was very good. Uh, from the standpoint of very clearly outlining who we are uh, and why we do what we do, and uh, appreciate the lesson he provided last night. Um, look forward to continuing to work with you in the future, and as you prepare to go back to uh, uh, overseas here at the beginning of next week, uh, I know we're going to have many good years ahead of us uh, together in partnership. Let's go to God in prayer. Merciful Father, we humbly come before you at this time, Father. We praise your name. We glorify you. We thank you for loving us, Father. It's demonstrated through the life that your son lived on this on this earth and the, de- the death that you allowed him to endure on our behalf. Father, we pray that all who are aware of what was done for them, for the salvation of their soul, will be grateful, will be moved with love, And, Father, will be moved to action and obedience to your word. Father, we pray that where possible we will be the instruments of relaying that gospel to those who may have never heard, those who may have heard but have not yet believed. Father, we pray that you will guide us to those who have hearts to hear and who have hearts to to be changed by the gospel uh, to live for you. Pray, Father, that you'll please continue to be with every person that's here tonight. Pray, Father, that you'll please bless us, help us to overcome challenges in our lives, looking always to thee for strength and guidance. We thank you for the grubs, Father, for the work that they're doing overseas. We pray, Father, that you please continue to bless them and, and all of our work in partnership together. We pray, Father, that you'll give them safe travels as they prepare to depart in the not-too-distant future. Pray, Father, that you'll continue to bless all of the efforts that we support in this area and throughout the world so that the gospel may be spread. 
Father, forgive us when we stumble. Help us to live for you and, and repent when we realize what we've done and come back to you uh, so that we can be found faithful on that, on that day of judgment. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good evening. Good, evening. Good evening. Could you please grab a song book and turn to song number 25? 25. Anywhere with Jesus. Number 25. Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go, anywhere he leads me in this world below, anywhere without the dearest joys would say, anywhere with Jesus I am not. I can give you an invitation number. I was planning on giving it up there. Excuse me. after the lesson will be number it is tonight to be together again as we study a portion of God's will, as we come to the end of this gospel meeting, and it is our hope and prayer that God has been pleased with the lessons that have been delivered this week, and we hope that the lessons that have been delivered will cause us to think about our responsibility in the sight of God, and to encourage us in the work that we're striving to do for God. Tonight our topic is the second coming of Christ. Uh, in many times when I conduct a gospel meeting in different places, I like to end the meeting talking about the second coming. Because one of the reasons we're doing what we're doing is because Christ came the first time. He came to this earth. He lived a perfect life. He suffered and died on the cross. He rose from the dead the third day, and then he ascended back to the Father. And so you see the passage 
that's listed at the top of the chart, Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. And the scripture is not actually on the screen, so if you'd like to open your Bible to that passage, we'll read the account of the ascension of Christ. You know, when we talk about the resurrection, the fact that Jesus rose from the dead and did not die again, so people might ask, well, if he rose from the dead and he did not die again, where is he? And of course the answer is found in Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. He ascended back to the Father. And so in Acts 1, beginning in verse 9, Now when he had spoken these things while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up. Behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. In Revelation chapter 1, and verse 7, again, this is a scripture that is not on your screen, but in Revelation 1 and verse 7, John writes, Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. And so, Jesus ascended to the heaven, and he's going to come back with the clouds in a like way that he ascended from this earth. Now, when we talk about the second coming of Christ, we recognize that people are interested in this topic. Every few years, someone will come along setting the date for our Lord's return. Now, not all of us remember the year 1844. Uh, maybe you do, but most of us don't. That was when William Miller set the date for the return of Christ. And when Christ did not return, he said, well, you know, I miscalculated a little bit. It should be 1848. And so in 1848, the claim was made that Christ would return to this earth but he did not return. Now we could go farther back than that. Even in the second century, people believed that Christ was going to come back. And not only did they believe he was going to come back, but that he was going to reign on the earth for a thousand years. And you see on the screen at the bottom, the idea of premillennialism. Premillennialism is the idea that Christ will reign on the earth a thousand years. Brother Floyd Wallace Jr. defined premillennialism this way. Pre means before, millennial means a thousand years, and ism means it just ain't so. And so uh, that gives you an idea of premillennialism. But talking about setting dates, along came Charles Taze Russell in the late 1800s into the early 1900s. And 1914 was set as the date when Christ would come. Well, he didn't come. So what they ended up saying was, well, he came secretly and appeared to a few people. And so 1914 was the date. 1925 was supposed to be another date. The person that took, off, uh, took over from Charles Russell, J.F. Rutherford, wrote a book in 1925 entitled, Millions Now Living Will Never Die. And the prediction was in that book that in 1925, Christ would come back to the earth, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob would be raised from the dead, and they would live in California. And so they built a mansion in the state of California so that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob would have a place to live when Christ came back. And we could mention the date, 1932, and other dates. But then 1975 was a date that some religious people gave as the time that Christ would come back to this earth. 
I remember Herbert W. Armstrong, who was involved with the Worldwide Church of God. I was driving to a preaching appointment when I was attending Fried Hardman College back in 1972. And I heard him say on this radio program that in the next two to eight years, Christ was going to come back and reign on the earth. Well, that was 1972. That's been a few years ago. And that did not happen. And then in recent times, I didn't realize it had been that long until I looked at my notes. In the year 2011, that was 11 years ago, in 2011, there was a radio preacher in the United States who spent a lot of money advertising that Christ was going to return on the 21st of May in 2011. And he had uh, trucks that had billboards on them and, and all kinds of announcements saying that Christ was going to return on the 21st of May in 2011. Well, he didn't come back then. So again, of course, he said, miscalculated. October 31st is the date in 2011. And so again, he did not come. Well, all these people that have predicted the return of Christ, they all died. And the earth, the world, is still standing. I, I skipped over one fellow who wrote a book entitled 88 Reasons Why Christ Would Return to the Earth in 1998. Then he wrote a sequel to that book. 99 reasons, or 89 reasons, why Christ would return to the earth in 1989. Well, people are interested in the second coming, but many of the religious people in this world hold to the idea that when Christ came to the earth almost about 2,000 years ago, he had planned to set up his kingdom, but he was not able to do it because the Jews rejected him as being king. And so what he decided to do, he would set up a temporary uh, organization, and he called it the church. And the church would serve a purpose until the time that Christ could come back again, and then he would set up the kingdom. They, they failed to deal with the question, if the Jews rejected Christ the first time, who's to say they won't reject him the second time. And the idea that Christ came to the earth, that God sent his son to the earth, and that he actually failed in what he planned to do. God failed. Christ failed. And if he failed the first time, who's to say he would not fail the second time? And so this is just a part of what people think about in regard to premillennialism. Can premillennialism be proved in the Bible, or is it just the doctrine of men? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 21, the Bible says, Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. John 7, 17, if any man, will, uh, if any man willeth to do the will of God, he shall know of the doctrine, whether I speak of self, uh, myself. Uh, whether I speak of men or I, uh, whether I speak of God or I speak of myself. And then Matthew 15, verses 8 and 9. These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. That's Matthew 15. Verses 8 and 9. Again, what does this doctrine include? It includes the idea that the first time Jesus came to the earth, he came to establish his kingdom, but since the Jews rejected him, instead he set up a temporary institution, that is, the church of Jesus Christ. Now, note the scriptures that are listed at the bottom of this paragraph. Note, please, in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 10 and 11, God had planned to establish the church before the foundation of the world. In 1 Peter 1, verses 18 through 21, 
Peter also tells us that the plan for Jesus, the Messiah, to come and suffer and die on the cross was a plan that was made before the foundation of the world. And so when Jesus came to the earth, and in Matthew 16, verses 18 and 19, he says, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto you, Peter, the keys of the kingdom. He talks about the church in verse 18. He mentions the kingdom in verse 19. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bound on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Jesus, when he made that statement in Matthew 16, verses 18 and 19, he was not making up a plan B. This was the original plan that God had from the foundation of the world. And we read from the Old Testament, beginning in Genesis 3.15, where God speaks to Satan and says that the woman would bear a child, that he would bruise the head of Satan, and Satan would bruise his heel. And it would be in the fullness of time that that took place, Galatians 4 and verse 4. And then we read of the promise that God made to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. He was going to make of Abraham a great name. He was going to make of him a great nation. We know not only one great nation, but many great nations came out of Abraham. But that great nation that he was talking about were those who would descend through Isaac and Jacob who would eventually become the children of Israel. But not only would God make a great nation out of Abraham, he would, through Abraham's seed, bless all families or all nations of the earth. And that phrase that we read in Genesis 12, 3 is repeated over and over and over in the Old Testament, referencing the time when the seed of Abraham, and that is Christ, Galatians 3, and verse 16, not as to seeds as of many, but as of one, and that seed is Christ. You know, Abraham had a lot of descendants. Abraham's first son was Ishmael, and there were Ishmaelites. After Sarah died, Abraham married Keturah and had six more sons, and one of those sons was Midian. You've heard of the Midianites. Those were descendants of Abraham as well. But the promise that God made to Abraham would be through Isaac, Jacob, Judah, down to David, and down to the time of Christ. And when Jesus is born of a virgin, as recorded in Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25, he grew up with his mother and her husband Joseph. And then we read of his Baptism by John the Baptizer in Matthew chapter 3, and he began his personal ministry on this earth. All of that was the plan of God. And so when Peter made that good confession in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 16, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus made the promise concerning the church. And after Jesus died on the cross, was buried, and rose again the third day. He spent about 40 days with his apostles, Acts chapter 1, telling them the things that were going to be involved in the preaching of the kingdom. And then in Acts 2, when that first Pentecost came, after Jesus rose from the dead, the Holy Spirit descended upon the apostles. They spoke in different languages and drew attention to themselves. People coming from all different parts of the Roman Empire. They spoke Hebrew. They were Jews. Many of them spoke Greek because Greek was the language of the Roman Empire, like English is today in many places. English is the second language today in many countries, and people speak English in a lot of places besides the United States. But they spoke the languages of their villages as well. And it was those languages 
that the apostles were speaking to them, and they were hearing these things in their own language. And so that drew attention to Peter and the apostles, so that Peter stood up with the eleven, and he began to use the first key as we talked about earlier in this gospel meeting. He began to use the first key that God gave him, that Christ gave him, to open the door of the kingdom to the Jews. Because on that day of Pentecost were Jews. There may have been proselytes there, but they were still Jews. And it was when Peter came to the conclusion in verse 36, Let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. When they heard this, they were pricked or cut to the heart, and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is unto you and to your children, and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And then verse 47 says, Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. And so the promise that God made to establish the church, his kingdom, was fulfilled in Acts chapter 2. In Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13, Paul tells us that God has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. What did he do? He has translated us, conveyed us into the kingdom of Christ. Well, in order for us to be in the kingdom, it has to exist. And so it came into existence on that first day of Pentecost after Jesus rose from the dead. John says, I am your brother in tribulation and in the kingdom. Revelation 1 and verse 9. So Jesus did not come to this earth and fail. He did not have a backup plan to come back and try the second time, nor was it the purpose of God to set up an earthly kingdom like David, but a spiritual kingdom that would include both Jews and Gentiles. Premillennialism teaches that Christ's coming is imminent. That means any minute, any minute. It says that there are many signs that will take place before Christ's coming. Let's talk about that for a minute. We do not know, we're going to talk about this in the main point of our lesson. We do not know when Christ is coming back, and we're going to look at the verses for that. But to say that there are many signs before Christ's coming is to misinterpret Matthew chapters 24 and 25. Now, we don't have time tonight to read those two chapters, but to summarize what those two chapters are talking about, Jesus is meeting with his apostles, and he, he talks about the fact that um, tear this temple down, I'll rebuild it in three days. And they said, you know, how can you do that? How can this temple be destroyed? They thought, and the apostles thought in their own mind, because remember, they were Jews. They thought, if the temple's going to be destroyed, that must be the end of the world. That must be the end of the world. So they asked him concerning the destruction of Jerusalem and the end of the world. They thought they were asking one question. But in fact, they were asking two questions. The first question was in regard to the temple and the city of Jerusalem. And so Jesus proceeds to talk about the destruction of the temple and Jerusalem in Matthew chapter 24 
verses 4 through 34. And in this section, Jesus gives signs to warn the Christians of the coming destruction. And he says, when you see these signs, flee out of the city. Get out of the city. Josephus records that when the Roman armies came and surrounded the city of Jerusalem, there was a point in time where they withdrew for a while. And it was then that the Christians left the city and were not trapped in Jerusalem to die in that particular place. And so Jesus says, this, verse 34, this generation shall not pass away till all these things come to pass. Well, what, what things was he talking about? He's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. And in A.D. 70, that generation was still around, and Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed. And I don't want to go on further because I'll get into the rest of my lesson. But in the second part of that passage, uh, he has a transition passage in verse 35. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. And then I'll just give you verse, the first part of verse 36. But of that day, an hour knoweth no man. Okay? What day is he talking about? He's talking about the second coming. And so this idea that premillennialism teaching that Christ's coming is imminent, we've even had religious leaders set the dates as we've already talked about when Christ is going to come. And I remember one preacher said, if somebody sets the date for the second coming, you can pretty be pretty sure Christ is not coming on that day. Because Jesus says nobody knows the day that Christ is coming back. And so the idea to make those statements is to misunderstand what the Bible teaches. And so in this lesson, we will, we will examine the Scriptures to see what it teaches in regard to the second coming. In the first place, we ask the question, is Christ coming again? And we put down three passages of Scripture for our consideration. We've already read from Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. We'll note once again what those two men said that stood by the apostles. They said in verse 11, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. Is Christ coming again? According to Acts 1, 9 through 11, he is coming again. Turn to Hebrews 9, and let's look at verses 27 and 28. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 27 and 28. And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many, to those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. The writer of Hebrews says, Christ is coming again. In 2 Peter 3, verses 1 through 9, and we're not going to read this entire passage, but boy, this is a great passage. Because Peter is reminding them of things they have forgotten. Verse 4, where is the promise of his coming? For since the father fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Peter says, for this they willfully forget. 
that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. They said, you know, there's not been any, nothing special has happened since creation. Well, what about the flood, folks? That was a pretty special event. And Peter reminds them of, them of that. And then he says in verse 7, But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Who is in control of this universe? Who is in control of the world in which we live? It is not us. It is God. The same God that created the universe. You know, you think about the, apart from the sun, 93 million miles away, you know, you heard about the two guys, they weren't too bright. They were going to go to the sun in a spaceship. And somebody said, well, you can't do that. You'll burn up. They said, no, we're going at night. Well, you know, that's the nearest star, our sun, 93 mi million miles away. But after that, the nearest star is 1.3 or 4 light years away from the earth, Alpha Centauri. We couldn't get there if we tried. That's the nearest star besides the sun. Would we be uh, arrogant enough to say that we had the power and ability to create all the stars, the sun and the moon that God created, and this earth that he created in six days. He is in control. And you know who is going to destroy this earth? It's not you and me. It is God. God's in control. And so we do what we can to help preserve our environment. But God's in control of this thing. And he is going to be the one to destroy this earth. Well, in verse 8, Peter says, But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Well, you know, for us, think back to yesterday. You can remember some of the things you did yesterday, right? Not everything, maybe, but some of the things that you did yesterday. And yesterday was not that long ago. But with God, a thousand years is like that. A thousand years is just one day. And one day as a thousand years. That means time doesn't really mean anything to God. And so when we think back to the beginning of the church about 2,000 years ago... Wow, 2,000 years ago, two lifetimes of Methuselah, plus a little bit. That's a long time ago. But to God, it's just two days, just like two days. And so again, people talk about the fact as to when Christ is going to come back. We don't know when that will be. If 2,000 years to God is just like two days, then 10,000 years from now will not be that long to God. Plus, as verse 9 tells us, it gives us an opportunity to reach people with the gospel of Christ. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Yes, Christ is coming again. But he hasn't come yet. And so we have an opportunity to prepare for his coming. And so we answer the second question. When will Christ come again? And now we're going to turn to Mark chapter 13. Mark chapter 13, and we're going to read verses 32 through 37. Mark chapter 13, verses 32 through 37. Note verse 31, a parallel passage to Matthew 24 here. He says, 
Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Verse 32, but of that day and hour, talking about the second coming now as opposed to the destruction of Jerusalem, but of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. When will Christ come again? Nobody knows. Nobody knows when Christ is going to come again. And so Jesus says, verse 33, Take heed, watch and pray, for you do not know when the time is. It is like a man going to a far country who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to each his work and commanded the doorkeeper to watch. Watch, therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming, in the evening, at midnight, at the crowing of the rooster, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say to you, I say to all, watch. We don't know when Christ is coming back. So what do we have to do? We have to prepare for his return. And we have to watch for it. You may have heard the illustration about a man who, uh, who hired a, a, a worker to work on his farm. And he asked this man, what is your qualification for working on my farm? And this man, who maybe didn't have a lot of education, said, he says, my qualification is, I sleep good at night. He said, that's my qualification. Well, the farmer decided to give him a try, give him a test. Well, one night, a big storm came up in the middle of the night. And the farmer ran to his servant's quarters and tried to wake him up. And he couldn't wake him up to help him get everything ready for the storm. And so he began to go around to the where the cows were and where the pigs were and where the chickens were and the barn where they had everything stored. And everything was locked up and secure. There was nothing that needed to be done by the farmer. And in the morning, the farmer told him about the storm that came in the night and that he tried to get him up to help him to prepare for that storm. But then he found that nothing needed to be done. And the worker said, don't you remember what I said? I sleep good at night. I get everything done before I go to bed. And so if something happens during the night, it's already been done. And so we are to watch and pray, for we know not the time when the Lord shall come. Now let's go back to 2 Peter 3.10. We almost got there when we, was talk when we were talking about 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 4 through 9. But then in 2 Peter 3 and verse 10, Peter says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Sorry, I didn't put the passage up there. There we go. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Jesus says that he is going to come like a thief in the night. When we lived in Taiwan, we had a church building. It was a five-story building, what they called storefronts over there in Taiwan. And we had the... First floor, we had uh, the meeting area. The second floor was the auditorium. The third floor was classrooms. And then the fourth and fifth floors were, was my office and Roger Campbell's office. We worked together at that time. One morning, I came into the building, and I'm walking up the stairs, and I'm between the third and the fourth floor, and I look down on the stair, and there's a, a smoked cigarette butt on the stairs. And I'm thinking, what in the world is that doing on the stairs? 
So I get up to my door, and what we had to do, we had to modify the building. And so we, we did a panel, a paneled wall with a wooden door. And when I got up there, there was a big hole in the paneling. Somebody had just taken their fist and busted it right through, and then they were able to reach in and unlock the door because the lock was a very simple lock into the office. They were looking for money, cash. Fortunately, I didn't have any cash in my office. All the cash was in Roger's office <laughs> on the fifth floor. They, they didn't go up there. But anyway, they, they came into the building. Well, they came in the middle of the night. They didn't call me ahead of time and say, Hey, tonight about 3 in the morning, tomorrow morning, we're going to come to your church building. We're going to break in, and we're going to try to steal something. Thieves are not that stupid. Now, I know some thieves are stupid. Like the, the thief that went into the bank to rob the bank, and he wrote his robbery note on the back of one of his deposit slips, one of his own deposit slips. Now, you know, if you do something like that, you should expect to get caught. But most thieves don't do that. On another occasion, I came out of the house in the morning to get in the car to drive to the church building. No car. I thought, well, I parked it around the corner. So I went around the corner. No car. Somebody stole my car in the middle of the night. He came as a thief in the night. Unexpected. We were not ready for it. And our vehicle was stolen. Well, a thief comes in the middle of the night. And there's no warning given concerning it. So there will be no signs concerning the second coming. Christ is going to come like a thief in the night. And we have no idea when that is going to be. When Christ returns, what will he do? When Christ returns, what will he do? I'm, I'm working on it. There we go. Number one, he will raise the dead. John chapter 5 Verses 28 and 29. Trying to get it up there for you. There it is. Jesus says, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Note the word resurrection here is in the singular. It will be one resurrection of both the righteous and the unrighteous. Further, when Jesus comes, he will judge the world. We've already noted together Acts 17, verses 30 and 31, and the times of this ignorance God winked at or God overlooked, but now commands all men or all people everywhere to repent. Because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. And so Paul, when he preached at Mars Hill, he told these Athenians, that they needed to repent. And the time was going to come when Christ would judge the world in righteousness. In 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10, the Bible says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. And then in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 12. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written, written in the books. When Christ comes again, he will return the kingdom to the Father. Christ will return the kingdom to the Father. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 
verses 23 and 24. But each one in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward those who are Christ's at his coming. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and all power. Now here's what the Bible says. The Bible says that right now, Christ has all authority in heaven and in earth. But the premillennialist says he doesn't have any authority yet. He hasn't come to reign on his throne yet. But then the Bible says he's going to turn that authority back to the Father. But the premillennialist says that's when he's going to start ruling and have his authority. It's just exactly opposite from what the Bible says. Christ came to earth almost 2,000 years ago. We might say even over 2,000 years ago now. And he is going to come again. Because he is coming again, we are preaching the gospel to a lost and dying world. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 10 and 11. We'll just quote part of 11. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or evil. Verse 11 begins, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. We're trying to warn people of the coming judgment. Sometimes when People are driving in their automobiles. There's an accident that has taken place up ahead of us. And people that are coming from the other direction will flash their lights at us to try to give us a warning that there's some kind of problem up ahead. Some of you are too young to remember the... Um, the uh, ham, not the ham radio, but the, what were they called? The CB radios. Yeah, see, it's, so, it's been so long I even forgot uh, what you call it. And we were able to communicate in that way to let people know of something that was facing us in danger. Of course, a lot of people used it to let people know there were police up there so that they would slow down. But there have been many times when people would flash their lights because of a warning. Many years ago, there was a, a bridge that uh, collapsed on I-35 up in Minnesota. And there were people who went down into that chasm and were killed. There were some who stopped soon enough, who got out of their vehicles and ran back as far as they could to try to get people to stop so that they would not fall into that opening. Some just ignored the warning, and they died. What we are trying to do in the 21st century, we're trying to warn people of the coming judgment and also to give people the opportunity to become children of God and to enjoy the blessings that are found in Christ. So we find opportunities when we have them to let people know of our Savior who came to this earth, who died for us, who rose from the dead, proving by his resurrection to be the Son of God, Romans 1 and verse 4, who ascended back to heaven, who established his church almost 2,000 years ago, and we can be members of that church by believing the gospel message, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 and 2, Believing it with all of our heart, repenting of our every sin, confessing our faith in Christ, and then being immersed in water, our sins can be washed away by the blood of Christ. And then we rise to walk in newness of life, and we're in the church, the kingdom, where all spiritual blessings are found. And then we live one day at a time, putting the Lord first in our lives, 
striving to live in such a way that heaven will be our eternal home. We do not know when Christ is coming back, but he is coming. And it may be we will leave this earth before he returns. But you know, when we leave this earth, when we die, our destiny is set. It's fixed. And there's not going to be any second chances in the Hadean realm like the rich man wanted. He wanted a second chance. Abraham said, sorry, can't be done. He even wanted Lazarus to go back and warn his brothers who were at home on the earth. Abraham said, sorry. Of course, this was still under the law of Moses. He said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. The saving message of the gospel is available for all people. And we as children of God must and want to do everything we can to reach people with the gospel of Christ. And so tonight we've selected a song, Oh, Why Not Tonight? If tonight you are not a child of God and you're subject to that great invitation that Jesus offers, tonight you have an opportunity to put the Lord on in baptism and to begin living your Christian life, living it one day at a time, until we leave this earth or the Lord returns, whichever comes first. Tonight, if you're subject to the invitation of someone who has never obeyed the gospel, we hope you'll take advantage of that opportunity tonight. It may be you're watching on OABS tonight, and you're living in a remote area. We'll be more than happy to try to find someone to come to where you live or to meet you in your area to help you to learn the truth, to obey the truth. And maybe you're a member of the Lord's body and you've not been living as you should. Instead of living for Christ, you've lived for yourself or you've lived for Satan. You've brought public shame and reproach upon the Lord's body. And you need to come back and be restored and live for God once again. Either way, we're ready tonight to assist you in rendering obedience to the gospel of Christ. And we would urge you to come as together we stand and sing. Be 
I have one two-syllable word to uh, say. Ditto. <laughs> exactly what he said. Uh, thank you, Brother John, for these excellent, excellent lessons. And uh, we have uh, been enriched, greatly enriched, uh, with the with the the feast from uh, from these lessons. And we thank you so very much. But it's not just thank you for the words that we heard. Thank you for challenging us and helping us to remember that the Lord's Church is distinctive, that it stands out from the world, and that we are called out of the world into His marvelous light. And let's always remember that and strive to live our lives, not arrogantly, but in humility and love for lost souls, knowing that we have obeyed the gospel and we have put on Christ. And it is our mission is to try to bring as many souls to Christ before they ignore the warning and drive past us and crash through the, the hole in the bridge. Let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Father in Heaven, we give thanks to Thee so very, very much for the opportunities that we've had these past few nights to come to hear more of Your Word. Father, we pray that we may be thirsty for Your Word, that we may be hungry for Your Word, that we may desire more and more. And Father, thank you for the opportunities we've had to be satisfied to a certain extent. But help us, Father, to always hunger and thirst for righteousness, to hunger and thirst for studying your word and changing our lives to, be, to conform to thy will. Father in heaven, we thank thee for the great lessons that we've, we've learned tonight. And Father, we pray for, uh, for Brother John and Sister Etta as they go back to Indonesia next week. And we pray, Father, that you'd bless them in, the, in their journeys and bless them, Father, with the work that they're doing there. We also pray for Brother Stan and Sister Carol as they go to South Carolina and that, that there will be much good at the gospel meeting there, the meeting that, that uh, he'll be preaching in and that you would give him safe travels and bring them back safely. We pray, Heavenly Father, that we may be always looking around for those souls that are searching for the truth and be ready to help them, to teach them. We thank Thee, Father, for our new sister in Christ. We pray, Father, that we may be a source of encouragement to her, even in the fact that she is not able to be in public for very, very much because of her autoimmune disease. But we pray, Father, that we can still reach out to her and be a source of encouragement to her. We pray that we may be sources of encouragement also to others in this congregation. 
those who are new Christians, those who have been Christians for a long time, those who are suffering from, from emotional uh, problems, those who are suffering from cancers and, and, uh, and diseases. And we pray, Father, that we may behave as Christians ought to behave, to reach out, to help them, to encourage them, to support them, to do what we can to lessen the burden that they're carrying. Our Father in heaven, we ask that you bless us tonight as we, as we leave this place, go to our homes. Help us, Father, to remember what we've heard and ponder the things that we've studied in your word. Hide them in our hearts that we might not sin against thee. Father in heaven, thank you for all who are here tonight and all the nights that, that, we've, been, uh, that we've held this gospel meeting. We pray, Heavenly Father, now for these things. In Jesus' name, amen.